As a young boy, he was raised in a rural town, having no brothers or sisters. His parents, who were actively involved in ministry, both died when he was yet young. Then it was that this young boy, this prominent PK, or pastor's kid, would eventually separate himself to a, from a life that he knew to live a life of a hermit, living among the elements. He ate and survived on a vegetarian diet. We are told he never cut his hair or shaved his beard, always adorned in a dress code that was contrary to the culture of his time. He never got married, and seemingly he had no friends. And when he finally did appear in public, we are told he was always stirring up contention among the citizens. He aroused, in the midst of it all, the envy of religious and political leaders alike, arousing their outrage and their sense of disgust at hearing this young man. This would eventually lead to his arrest by officials that were influenced of, by the government of his time. And it wasn't long after he was arrested that somebody found his beheaded body in prison. From the look of things, this young man lived a life without much meaning and purpose and value, or so it seemed. But this is not what Jesus had to say about John the Baptist, this young man. In fact, Jesus had rather complimentary things to say about John the Baptist. We are told, and I quote Luke 7, verse 28, Jesus speaking said, Among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. His ministry was the shortest ministry of all the prophets. Yet Jesus said, there is none greater than John the Baptist. It is always, I don't know about you, but it's always a pleasurable privilege when Jesus can speak well of you. Could somebody say amen? amen. Oh yes, your mother, your spouse, your brother, your sister, your friend may speak well of you, but when Jesus makes that pronouncement, when Jesus affirms you, I want to declare to you that there is nothing more calculated to give your self-esteem a boost than when Jesus pronounced, this is my beloved son, my beloved daughter, in whom I'm well pleased. We study the book of Job and we understand that even before Job went through his trial, Jesus told Satan who went through the earth looking for someone and said, I can't find anyone. Jesus said, you're crazy. Have you considered my servant Job? Don't you know he's an upright man? I am happy that Jesus looks and he sees my need. He looks beyond my fault and he calls me based on what he sees. Could somebody say amen? amen? Oh yes, we may fall down sometimes, but Jesus knows the path that you are taking and he calls you based on your motive and he calls you based on your intentions. That's why he said, David is a man after my own heart. And somebody asked the question, Pastor, was he a man after God's own heart when he slept with Bathsheba? The fact is he did confess, didn't he? Oh, we focus too much on the negative and not enough on the positive. He confessed, didn't he? In one of the songs of the Psalms, he said, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgression. It was a song, but it's a song that will never make the number one on the charts. It's a confession. He was singing this song, but he was with, filled with a contrite heart. Then he looked at Abraham and said, I love Abraham. Abraham is my friend. Are you still here with me? Abraham is my friend. Whatever I tell my friend, he just does it. I told him to get out from his country, leave his father, and the man just went. That's my friend. He trusts me. 
And one day, uh, I knew it was hard on him because his first son was born already. He was getting to know the first son. And then when the second son was born of the woman that he thought he would not have been born of, he began to develop an affinity to Isaac. But one day, I told him, come on, come on, Abraham. If you are my friend, I want you to take your only son and go up and sacrifice him. And they know the man without any remonstration or argument or debate just went. That's my friend. Are you still here with me? Oh, you look at the time when he lied, but he's still my friend. Oh, you're not hearing me, church. He is still my friend. I know he lied, and I, I know his heart is still with me. Because, you see, I have told you before, there is a difference between a sheep and a pig. When either of them fall into mud, the reaction is different. Oh, come on, talk to me, somebody. When the sheep falls into mud, he scrambles and he fights and he, he knows this is not common ground and he beats up. And even though he's unable to get out, he calls upon the shepherd and the shepherd comes and takes him up out of that mud. Are you still here with me? That's why I declare to you, if you are my sheep, the just man will fall seven times, but he will not be comfortable in the mud. Hallelujah! But when the pig falls, he says, Hallelujah. What took you so long? Just come on ground. Come on ground. I love this place. Oh man, this place, I can't wait for Carnival Monday and Tuesday. I love this place. I get excited when February comes around. And it's not because of my birthday. It's because of something else I keep looking for and forward to. I can't wait till the end of February. Tomorrow is Pana. Anyway, uh, I can't wait. I can't wait. You want to know how I know that? I read the news. <laughs> Tomorrow, some of you are getting ready for that. But the fact is, if you are a sheep of the shepherd... There are some things you will dislike because you cannot take pleasure in that which the shepherd hates. Hello, somebody. Help me, somebody. Help me, somebody. You cannot take pleasure in that which the shepherd hates. So when Jesus says, this is my son, I just like this boy. Uh, maybe you feel like that. Jesus says, I just like talking to her. Because when she gets up in the morning, the first thing she says is, Jesus, I, I just like this about her. She talks to me even before she talks to her husband. I, I like that about her. I get excited. And that's the kind of response we would want from Jesus. He, it wasn't Jesus who said, if you will confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. Hallelujah. If you are not ashamed of me, I will not be ashamed of you. Here in the book of St. John, John the Baptist was described as a burning and shining light. He grew up in the desert, you know, yet he was still shining. Lord have mercy. He grew up in hard times, but he was still shining. He grew up in the midst of recession, but he was still shining. He didn't have a job, and he may have lost his walk. I mean, he lost his work. He was still shining. Are you still here with me? His dress code was odd and weird, but it did not stop him from shining. For it is not where you are or the latest style that determines how bright you shine. Could somebody say amen? You see, Jesus, who is the light, cannot be limited by time or space. As such, light itself cannot be confined to circumstance or place. Light does not have any preference. It can shine anywhere. And that's why anywhere with Jesus you go, you can shine. 
Come on, talk to me, somebody. You can shine. You don't have to be afraid. There are some people who are afraid to go to certain places lest their light goes out. Let me tell you something. Light will go out when you take it out. But when you go in dark places, people must know that you have a light. They must know you stand for something. They must know you mean something. Are you still here with me? When you are the light, then you will light up somebody else's life. John the Baptist, because of his dress code, proved, I like this, John the Baptist, because of his dress code, proved that the gospel can be packaged differently without contaminating the contents. I, I like that. The, the gospel can be packaged differently without contaminating the contents. He was dressed in camel's hair, but he was still a prophet. He did not clothe himself in traditional garb, but he still spoke with conviction. He never went to USC. But when he spoke, crowds came upon him. Because it's not USC that gives you your anointing. Help me somebody. It's not USC that gives you your anointing. Your anointing comes from a school teacher that USC might need even now. Your anointing comes from the Holy Spirit. And I'm not trying to be counterproductive here today because I do believe in USC. I'm a product of USC. But I have learned that it's not the academia that matters when it comes to issues of salvation. Are you still here with me? With issues of salvation. You can stand up and proclaim God's word attending USC or not. God can anoint you. Could somebody say amen? I believe that with all my heart. He was uncultured in his mannerisms, but it didn't stop the glow of the light from within him from shining forth. His mannerisms and his language were unrefined, but the anointing was not denied. Because when God is upon you, it doesn't matter who you are, you can shine. But I like how Jesus put it. The Bible says he was a burning and a shining light. I'm happy Jesus didn't say he was burning alone. Neither did he say he was shining alone. Because there are many of us who burn but don't shine. Mm -hmm. We are doing so much, we say, for the Lord, but there's no light in us. You can be so actively involved in ministry, but there is no light. Are you still here with me? If you are going to burn for Jesus, people must still see the light of God in you. Are you still here with me? They must be able to pinpoint he is saying it on behalf of God. There must be something special about you. If you call yourself the church police, then you cannot act like ordinary police. There must be light in you. But then there are some who want to shine but they want to burn. Mm -hmm. You get quiet now, eh? They don't want to sacrifice anything, to give up anything. Shining must not cost them a thing. They want to preach, but don't want to study. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I, I know I'm touching some corns here today. There are many people who claim that they know what the Bible says, but you don't read it. You do it secondhand. You've got it from somebody who is an offshoot. And you're speaking with authority that you don't have. How can you preach without this? You need this. Come on, talk to somebody. You need, let me tell you something. You cannot get anointing secondhand. <laughs> you cannot cut and paste the Holy Ghost. Oh, Lord have mercy. I lost some of you right there, didn't I? Huh? This is not something you can concoct. You get your anointing from studying this. I am old-fashioned, but I am new, ever new. This Bible, when you get into this thing, it gives you a power, a power that man cannot resist. He might dispute, but he cannot refute because the Bible has a power in it. I've seen it happen. People might sit down. One of, the, one of the blessings I have as being a preacher is that I get to preach to people of different occupations, different professions. And I've seen 
You know, let me go back a bit. When I was, tra- I think I told this story already. When I began traveling, I realized that people everywhere are people anywhere. And the only textbook I carried was this. Whether it was throughout the Caribbean, Bermuda, uh, St. Croix, United States, England, Africa, Canada. I used this alone, Brother T. This was my only textbook. And people of different walks of life, of different ethnicities, different nationalities responded to this. There is a power in this. Could somebody say amen? There is a power in this. See, if you want to learn how to preach, you've got to learn how to burn some time in this. You want to learn how to sing like video, but you don't want to practice voice techniques. You feel you can cut and paste a voice like that? It takes time. You have to learn how to burn. You want to play professionally, but it don't come rehearsals. Or it come when you want. You want to teach, but you don't want to learn your lesson. You want to pass, but you don't want to study. But when the time for C-Sec comes around, you want to, people to pray for you. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Oh, Lord, I got somebody right there. I, 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 help me out. Help me out there. The fact is, you got to learn how to burn because success comes by burning. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. The old adage is still correct. The heights of great men reached and kept were not attained by sudden flight, but they, while their companions slept, were toiling upwards through the night. If you've got to burn, you've got to learn to put away the text in. Hello, somebody. Help me, somebody. Huh? And church, I, I, you hear me say it over and over, but I've seen the enemy using our cell phones to keep us from burning in the presence of God. We do more texting than text. We know more how to text and know more about the text. Uh, somehow, the technology is making or sending our brain into retrenchment. People don't want to think anymore. You go to school, they don't want to think. They don't want to use a cerebrum which God has given to you. When the truth is, the greatest computer ever made was the human brain. I read several years ago that if a computer is to be made to function everything, or if the brain, yes, the computer is made to function everything like the brain, it will have to be at least 102-story buildings high. To do everything the brain does. Your brain has a camera. The human eye. That's why you can remember colors. Well, some guys have problems, but... (laughs) (laughs) We have an ear that can outsmart the keyboard. We can hear different tones that the keyboard has not yet been able to play. Are you still here with me? This is, this is God's marvel. And yet we are setting aside God's marvel for man's invention. When man needed God's marvel in order to invent what he invented. Are you still here with me? Oh, instead of standing back and admiring the iPhone, you must look at yourself and start admiring what God has done, what God has fashioned with his own hands. We've got to learn how to burn as for Jesus. He was a burning and shining light. Burning means that you, have, you must have a passion for something. John had a passion for the right and he was intolerant of evil. He was tolerant of sinners while being intolerant of sin. Maybe I said it a different way. He was accepting of sinners while being intolerant of sin. So he accepted people coming to hear him, but then he took a toll or he took an attack on sin. He is not known to have many friends, but we should know that when you speak the truth, you will win enemies and lose friends. Could somebody say amen? John's ministry, according to the text that we have read, was not clothed in soft raiment. Oh, I want to spend a little time on this before we get to you guys. Soft raiment. 
soft raiment. The soft raiment that's being referred to is, is the raiment that was worn by those in the king's court. Soft raiment. Mm -hmm. People who are soft in how they treat one another. And nothing is wrong with being polite and courteous, but that's not the implication of the text. What it suggests is that there are people in the court who will, not, who will see sin but not denounce it. Because you see, you are in the, in the king's court because of favor. Unless I ruin my favor and favorable position, I will see the king sleeping with his brother's wife and say, King, you look so lovely. And while we smart at that, the fact is many of us do it even in church. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything about that girl because that's the pastor's child. <laughs> I'm not going to talk, and I want to be in the pastor's good books or, or the elder's good books. And we have an attitude that we don't denounce sin because of who is the sinner. Oh, Lord, have mercy. You're not, you're not helping me up here. You're not helping me up here. That's the fact. Because, you see, we are clothed with soft raiment. And not knowing, the enemy is numbing our senses to sin until sin looks and feels acceptable. I was doing an intervention in, in a particular school when... The teacher came to me and told me that a young boy, age nine, took his father's pistol, and this is Trinidad, and went and robbed nine years. Robbed and went back home, put his father's pistol back, and he was cool. He is now going to school, normal. He has a reputation for doing things like that. Of course, the father did not know what he had done. He got reprimanded, but he said, Daddy, I was only doing what I saw you doing. Mm -hmm. And it was a way of life for him because he keeps seeing it. And the more crime we keep hearing and the more homicide we keep hearing, we get so numb to it that it becomes a way of life. Are you still here? And the devil is doing that so he can be numb our senses to sin until sin no longer seems sinful. If you lime often with people who commit certain kinds of sin, when you join the clan and it's no longer as bad as you thought it was because your senses have become numb and now you are in the king's palace with soft raiment. Mm. I want to declare to you, brothers and sisters, that too many of our contemporary preachers are clothed in soft Raymond, we, we, mm -hmm. you hear things like, oh, your blessing is coming this year. Your new this is coming, and your new that is coming. When the praises go up, the blessings come down. Now, I don't have any challenge with that theory. I believe we must praise God, but we don't praise God in order to be blessed. We praise Him because we are blessed. <laughs> I'm already blessed. I don't need to get a thing again. I'm a, I'm a blessed person. That's why I praise Him. But you see, if you want to pander to the congregation, to the appetite of the congregation, if your, your motive is to gain numbers and keep numbers, you're not going to denounce sin. And many times we find preachers no longer declaring what God says as it relates to sin. But John the Baptist was not clothed in soft raiment. I am happy to declare to you that John told it like it was. Oh, Lord, let me turn this side. John told it like it was. You see, sin with high heels is still sin. Come on, talk to somebody. Sin wearing Stacey Adams' shoes is still sin. You can put cologne on it. You can put perfume on it, makeup on it, dress on it. It is still sin. It doesn't matter if it has soft raiment. It is still sin. And John knew what sin is, and he declared it. His message was one of repentance. And I want to declare to you that flattery, this is something I've discovered, flattery can do more harm to the sinner than rebuke. Mm -hmm. Some people know that they're going down the wrong way, but because they don't want to upset, they flatter you. Flattery. Didn't uh, Solomon say that? Uh, faithful are the wounds of a friend. But the kisses of an enemy are deceit. Didn't he say that open rebuke is better than secret love? 
secret love. And as I thought about this, I reflected on David and his experience with the bear and the lion. And there's a lesson that came to me. This is how my mind works. A lesson that came to me because it, there's a difference between a lion when it attacks and a bear. A lion will tear you apart. You will know what he's about, but a bear will hug you to death. So not every hug you get. Oh Lord, have mercy. Oh Lord, have mercy. Oh Lord, have mercy. Uh, there are some bears in the church who may hug you with flatteries. Oh, you're not listening to me, church. They may hug you, but their hug is fatal. So there are some bears you've got to be mindful of. And that's why it's somehow we might know who the lions are, but it's difficult to know when the bears are around. That's why I declare to you that flattery is more dangerous than rebuke. Well, John was not a reed shaken in the wind. That's what we read a while ago. He was no reed shaken in the wind. In other words, John was not moved by popularity. No wonder he spent time in the wilderness. He was not moved by popularity. He said things based on his connection with the God. And there's a good lesson we learn by John being in the desert because there was no one around but him and God. There comes a time when you're going through your desert experience when there's a blessing in the desert, when you can spend time with God and God alone. There are some things that God will tell you alone that he will never tell you when you have someone else around. Do you know what I'm talking about? So John would have spent sufficient time with his God alone so that when he came, he came representing the God that he knew. He was no reed shaken in the wind. So one day, one day, one day he was having a campaign, Brother Samuel. It was one of those heated campaigns, those crusades, and King Herod decided to drop by because he heard that John was preaching and leading many people to his doorsteps. Wherever he went, people kept coming. And because he was a king, it was in his political interest to go and find out who this young preacher was. The mistake the Herod made was that he came during the time when John was dealing with the seventh commandment. You know what I mean, church? With the seventh commandment. And, and somehow, when he was dealing with the seventh commandment, he began to say, it's wrong for a man to commit adultery. And even if he does it in his heart, he has already committed it already. And maybe Herod heard it and said, he shook his head because he knew that nobody else would say anything to him. And then John stopped the sermon and said, you, Herod. Now, that's embarrassing. You, Herod, you're folding your arms and crossing your legs, tipping down your glasses as if everything's all right because you are in this soft chair and nobody will tell you anything. I want to let you know it's wrong for you to sleep with your brother's wife. In the midst of a sermon, the man started to talk to Herod. Yes, you. And Herod looked around and wondering, who was he? Don't look back. It's you are talking to. And John didn't say it as nice as I am saying it because John didn't learn the Queen's English as good as I did it. He, yeah, you are talking about. Yeah, you. Yeah, bread. It's you are talking. Yes. You call yourself Herod. You are in charge of all these people. You're wrong, boy. You're wrong. And everybody looked at John and said, John, take it easy. That's Herod. So what is Herod? Sin is sin. Whether it's Herod or not, king or not, rich or poor, it's sin. Get out of that relationship. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. He was uncouth and unkempt, but he said it like it is. But he didn't do it to hurt him. It's to heal him. I want to save you. But I can't save you when you're comfortable in your soft raiment. And Herod from that day told himself, you see, I'm not going back in that crusade again. From what we have learned, John lost his head. He didn't lose his mind. <laughs> but he lost his head. Because he told it like it is. He was unflinching. 
Bible says, yes, you will grow up strong in spirit. You know what that means? A person who is strong in spirit is a person who is not allowing passions to control him. Mm -hmm. But a person who is in control of his passions. Now, it sounds good saying it that way, but it's, it's, it's tantamount to blessed are the meek in spirit, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. Blessed are the meek. And I look at the word meek and I realize it was borrowed from the language used to describe a bullock or a cow or an ox in relation to a man. Now put an ox next to a man. You know pound for pound the ox is bigger. Are you still here with me? The ox is mightier. The ox can do anything to the man, but the ox obeys the man. Because the ox has strength under control. Ah, Jesus. And that is what meekness is. Having strength under control. So I can give you a piece of my mind, but I have it under control. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Eh? When I enter into puberty, these passions come upon me like a flood. I should go out and sleep around, but I have it. Yes, you listen to me. Eh? I have the desire and the thirst to drink, but God now has taken control of my life. I should put the bottle to my mouth, but God has given me strength under control. And that's what being waxed strong in spirit is all about, is somebody who controls his emotions. So instead of slapping as he used to slap, there are some of you I know used to use a lot of obscenities. Well, okay, you're not saying amen, maybe you still do. <laughs> but for those of you who used to use a lot of obscenities, anybody got your vex every other word? Your Webster couldn't even find it. Eh? Every other word was a mm -hmm, and a bleep bleep and a mm, bleep bleep bleep. bleep. And you woke up in the morning, bleep bleep bleep. Or, and that's what happened to you. And now when you became a Christian, even when you're praying, you have to struggle to pray properly because every other word was. <sighs> now I know what I'm talking about because I've met people like that. And I'm saying, but when God's Holy Spirit takes control of you, there are some things you don't say anymore. And some of you have looked at your life currently and said to yourself, when people get you annoyed, if they only know what I was before I met the Lord, before I, I would have given them a piece of me. Look, that man, they get away, you know. I know some of you have said it, but now you have strength under control and the reason why he can do that is because he said one statement and I think this characterized his ministry he said I must decrease that he might increase I must decrease that he might increase because you see John knew his place in John chapter 1, he says, I am not the light. I came to bear witness of the light. Sometimes because the light has given us so many privileges, we forget that we are not the light. And we forgot the light who gave us privileges. Oh, Lord, I'm not there. I didn't say it right. The talents and the gifts that you have are not yours. Those gifts that made room for you, that caused people to applaud you and like you, you got to remember who the giver is. You are not the light. You must always decrease so that the light will increase inside of you. And so even as you are about to do ministry for the Lord, you must remember that I must decrease so that he might increase. But even saying that seems foolish because you already decreased. How dare you talk about I must decrease? But you see, it is acknowledging my place. And when you acknowledge your place, you don't have to envy anybody else. Oh, Lord, have mercy. You don't have to be envious or jealous of anybody else because this is my place. John came on the scene and people kept coming to John, but there came a time when that same crowd started to go to Jesus. 
Are you still here with me? I started to go to Jesus because there comes a time when your ministry will come to an end. People will not always flock to you because God always has people whom He will call into ministry. There comes a time when you must decrease that Jesus will increase inside of you. I guess the best way to say it is that an increasing Jesus means a decreasing self. The more he increases, the more I decrease. I decrease because of him in me. And when you do that, brothers and sisters, people meet you and they say all nice things about you. Just remember that you are not the light. You are not the light, but you are bearing witness of the light. Because you know of yourself you could not shine. You could not be so good. But God is using you for his honor and glory. And God will use you as long as you are available. Even if you are not able, as long as you are available, God will use you for his honor and glory. I believe it with all my heart. But what you've got to do is, as a songwriter says, take time to be set aside, to be holy. Speak oft with the Lord. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. I abide in him always. And that's the secret of being set aside, spending time with Jesus. And folk come in contact with you, they must come in contact with Jesus. With this in mind, we have some young men, I hope I can say that without any fear of contradiction, who are willing to be set aside for service. They are willing to burn that they might shine, burn their passion for Jesus, and burn with passion for righteousness and for truth. Once you burn for Jesus, you will shine his light in you. As we sing this song, Take Time to Be Holy, I would ask the elders, the two elders who are going to be set aside today to come forward on my right. And all the deacons who are going to be set aside to come on my left. And then I will ask all the other ordained elders and ordained deacons to stand by. Take time to be holy. Take time to be holy. I want you to sing, sing. And feed on his word. This is the burning experience. Make friends of God's children. Help those who are weak. Forgetting in nothing his blessing to sing come on sing again second stanza take time to be holy the world rushes on spend much time in secret with Jesus alone by looking to Jesus like him, thou shalt be. Thy friends and thy conduct. Before we sing the third 
it stands, I'm going to ask all the elders to be on this side, to gather around the elders here as far as possible. All of the elders, all of the deacons on my left. As we sing the third stanza. Come, let's go together. Take time to be holy. Take time, time to, to be holy. Let him be thy guide. Let him be thy guide. And run not before him. And run not before him. Whatever, Whatever be time. Be time. In joy or in sorrow. Follow the Lord and look into Jesus. Come on, sing. Last stanza. 